and I'm loud. And who said that? Uh-huh. I'll get you later. All right. So he is no less worthy of our praise tonight as he was this morning. So before we start to sing, I want you to stand up and give the Lord some praise. He's worthy, isn't he? He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. And I love the Lord. You know, uh, I'll tell you something funny. Um, when I'm walking Benji in the mornings, it's dark usually. And one morning I was walking down through there, be bopping, and I was praying and I was worshiping, you know, out loud, because that's what I do. And I want you to know, there sat one of the neighbors on their porch. And he was sitting there, and he just kind of looked at me. And I was like, good morning. How are you? <laughs> but you know what? Then I, I it was funny. But at the same time, he knows where I stand. He knows who I serve. And I'm thankful. But it was funny that morning. So Benji and I just kept walking. And I just kind of turned my back and was praising, you know. Because, um, you know, he's thinking, well, all right then. So, but I'm, I want to give God praise. I don't want the rocks to cry out in, in my place. I want to give him praise. So, all right, so tonight we are going to wing this one because we don't have it up there. I don't know why we don't. But this is a new name written down in glory. And, you know, I think about how that God and his, that there's rejoicing around the throne when someone comes to know the Lord. Isn't that great to think about? We are such blessed people. All right, so we're going to sing this song, just watermelon if you don't know it, okay? I know you know it because we've sung this a gazillion times. Ready? Here we go.
myself all the time that his blood made me royalty. And so many times we get caught up in the world and we forget who we belong to. Who is our Savior? Who is our Lord? Jesus, Messiah.
want to be filled up with his holy presence. And there's no mistaking when he enters the room. But he is a gentleman, and he will not come where he isn't welcome. So let's welcome him into this room.
also turning on my microphone. <laughs> Got it. All right. I, I believe in just the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. I tried every way to get out of this message tonight, every possible way, and this is the message that we're going with. I, I believe that when the Lord has a thought on our heart, when God speaks to us, it, it's intended for somebody. A uh, little different, a uh, little out of even my realm. Uh, I want you to go to Psalms 26 and verse 2, and we're going we're gonna to go to three verses in Psalms uh, that's going to kind of be our starting point for tonight. As always, it's great to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you for uh, coming back tonight and being with us, all of those that's on live stream I apologize for this morning when you couldn't hear me. I was having a good time up here and didn't really, the microphone was not one of my concerns in that moment. Uh, but I'm excited any time that I get an opportunity to stand. It's not about Nick Payne, it's always about Jesus Christ. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. Um, Psalms 26 and verse 2, if you're there, say amen. amen. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Go to Psalms 44 and verse 21. Psalms 44 and verse 21. Psalms 44, 21 says, Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Go to Psalms 139 and verse 23, and this will be our final verse. Psalms 139 and verse 23. The Bible says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. For, for just a, a little bit tonight, I, my prayer is that you just allow the Holy Spirit of God to just come and rest right in your presence. And tonight, this message is called The Question and Answer with Jesus. Can you imagine just for a moment that you pulled up a seat and Jesus pulled up a seat and there was a question and answer session? How many of you would love to be able to ask a bunch of questions? I'd love to. But tonight, it's not you or I asking questions. It's Jesus asking you the question. It is going to be a question and answer. But how many of you tonight will just allow the Holy Spirit of God to examine your heart, to search your thoughts, to search your heart, to see truly where you stand. Heavenly Father, right now I come and I just ask that what I have pleaded with our audience, I, I pray that you would just pull up a seat here tonight and that you would just do a work in my heart. You know every area of my heart. 
You know the areas I struggle in. You know the weights and the cares that I carry. And I pray tonight that as you ask these questions, that you won't hold back in searching every avenue of our heart. And may you move in a way that only you can move. And may you speak in a way that only you can speak. And, and we just, at the end of the night, we'll praise you for who you are. Thank you for coming to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you for showing the greatest love. You demonstrated the greatest act of love by dying on the cross for our sins. I love you, Jesus. Be with us now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. If you were with us, you may be seated. If you were with us this morning, we said that Jesus asked over 300 questions in his three-year ministry. So you uh, could consider this a part two of, of what uh, happened this morning. This morning, we dealt with two questions. Who do men say that I am? What does the world say about Jesus? And the greatest question that we all encountered this morning is, who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus to you? That is the foundation of all the questions that Jesus could have ever asked, is who is Jesus to you? Uh, I just want to remind you, I read this morning this, so why did Jesus ask so many questions? I'd love to go through the 300 plus questions that he asked, uh, but that's, that's going to take a little bit of time. So we're, the Lord has, has laid a few questions on my heart that he's going to ask us, and here's the great thing about it, you don't even have to answer it, the Lord's going to answer it for you, and you're going to see where you line up with him. So Jesus used questions to force us to confront our own hearts. He questions us not because he needs to know or understand something about what's going on, but because he wants us to know and understand the truth of what's going on. Through questions, Jesus forces us to turn our gaze on ourselves, our hearts, and our motivations. He makes us look deeply into ourselves. So tonight, we're going to do a little Q&A with Jesus. I hope that you've invited him just to pull up a seat right in front of you. If you've ever watched a, a talk show or 60 Minutes, they pull up and they have an eye to eye. They're asking questions. They're getting feedback. And tonight, Jesus is going to be asking you and I some questions. So go to Mark chapter 6 for our first questions. Uh, I, love this, uh, I love this passage. Matthew chapter 6, sorry. Matthew chapter 6. In verse 25, Jesus is on the mount. He's going through. He's teaching. Uh, and in just these short verses, Jesus asks eight different questions. And tonight, if you are like me, this is an area of my life that I do struggle with. This is on the topic of anxiety. Anybody else with anxiety? Sometimes I worry about the worrying. Does anybody, anybody else there? In chapter 25... Or chapter, verse 25, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. It says, therefore, it takes us back to what Jesus had previously talked about. In verse number 19, he says, lay not up for your, yourselves treasures upon earth. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We go on down to verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let me read that again. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Here's our first question. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? I want you to stop and just for a moment. Anxiety is a feeling of worry. It's nervousness. It's unease typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. If you know the outcome of something, you typically don't worry about it. But it is an ang a nervousness, a worry about an uncertain outcome. And it comes in, in every different type of way. But Jesus here, he says, take no thought for your life. And then he says, is not the life more than meat? Let me just go ahead and tell you, our life is more than just the food we consume. 
Our life is more than just the raiment that we put on our body. And Jesus goes a step further. Look at verse 26. He asks another question at the end. Are you not much better than they? Verse 26, Jesus says, behold the fowls of the air. Just think about the birds for just a moment. Uh, Corky, I know your love for birds. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. There's no amount of work that they put in, but what does the Father do? The Father feedeth them. Verse 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? I've always loved this verse. So a cubit is, is from the elbow to the top of the middle finger. So it's different people, different lengths, but it's about 17, almost 18 inches. Jesus says, how many of you by worrying can add any height to your stature? You can't. How many of you by worrying can change the outcome of something? You can't. How many of you, you've probably been like me, I have learned that worrying benefits nothing but, but usually sickness. There's a, all kinds of medical diagnoses for worrying, excessive worrying that happens in our body. And typically what I've learned is the things that I worry about never truly ever happen. It doesn't ever come to pass. I worry about this or I worry about that, and then it just goes away. There's nothing to be. But Jesus says, which of you by worrying, by having anxiety, can add anything to his stature? Verse 28, here's our next question. And why take you thought for raiment? Jesus is talking about the bare necessities of life. He says, don't worry about water, don't worry about food, don't worry about clothing, and that's just the bare necessities. I can go ahead and tell you, there's very few of us in this room that have ever worried about food, water, and clothing. Jesus never t talked about bills. Jesus never talked about family issues. Jesus never talked about the stress of a job. He never talked about worrying about sickness. He never worried about an upcoming meeting. If I know that I have a meeting with my boss, if he says, if he emails me and says, hey, let's talk on Tuesday instantly, there's like a pit in my stomach. I go, what have I done wrong? Anybody else? I mean, my mind is in instantly geared towards, I'm in trouble, Doug. He could give me an award, and I would still think something is going wrong. But how many of you, by worrying, can take? He says, consider the lilies. Think about the, the pretty flowers of the field, how they grow. They don't toil. They don't spin. And he says in verse 29, And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And our next question in verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the, into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? You are created in the image of God. You are created with a soul. And Jesus says, I take care of the fowls of the air. I take care of the lilies in the field. I take care of the grass that's in the field, and you are worrying about me taking care of you. Verse 31, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or with all shall we be clothed. I want to encourage you tonight, to the anxious heart, I'm going to let the Word of God speak to you. Look in verse 32. Let me just go ahead and tell you that your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Whatever you're struggling with tonight, whatever anxiety, that distracted care that you're carrying around, just know that the Father knows exactly what you need. He knows tonight. He knows what's burdening, burdening you. He knows what is stirring up inside of you. But look at verse 33. I think here's the key to our anxiety. When we are worried about stuff, typically our eyes are, are focused on other things. But what does Jesus say in verse 33? But seek ye first the kingdom of God. If you will turn your eyes to the kingdom of God, he says, and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. I don't know what you're worrying about tonight, but let me tell you. You take your eyes off it and put your eyes on Jesus. The anxious heart, we look at verse 34, Jesus says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Don't let today, don't let tomorrow ruin your day today. 
All of us in here know how quickly life can change. A phone call away, a breath away. Tomorrow may never be here, but Jesus says, take therefore no thought for the morrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. He says, for the morrow shall take, uh, take thought for the things of itself. I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 4 and let God continue to, to speak to us and answer this question. Why are you anxious? Why are you anxious? In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 through 8, The word of God says, be careful for nothing. Be anxious about anything. Don't let anything cause anxiety in your life. But in everything, by what? By prayer. You see, we have an anxious heart. What do we do? We run to him. We turn our focus on him. We begin to pray on him, knowing you and I cannot change anything, but he can change all things. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So when you and I begin to worry in such a state that it causes an upset stomach, you and I did not take our cares to the Lord. Look at verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. What is worrying? It is thinking on things. What does Jesus tell us to do? He tells us to think on those that are true. Well, who's true? Jesus. Who's honest? Jesus. Who's just? Jesus. Who's pure? Jesus. Who's lovely? Jesus. Who's of good report? Jesus. If you want to think on something, think on Jesus. The one that's never going to change regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstance. I love 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. It says, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Do you know that church? That he cares for you? He cares about everything that you're struggling with tonight. Whatever that anxious heart is, whatever situation is causing anxiety in your life, Jesus is simply saying, turn to me, give it to me, cast all your care upon me, for I care for you. Don't, he doesn't want us to waller in that anxiety. He doesn't want us to live in a state of anxiety, because I'm going to tell you, if you live in a state of anxiety, you're going to be rendered useless for the kingdom. Here's the second one. Go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And Jesus asked two questions here. So our first set of questions is all centered on anxiety. Mark chapter 4, we're going to begin reading in verse number 35. Mark 4, 35, And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves, the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he, Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and he rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And Jesus said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? So our question that I want Jesus to ask you is, why do you have a fearful heart? Why do you have a fearful heart? You see, that fear and that faith is linked together. It has been quoted many times that fear is the absence of faith. It's the absence of faith. To, to be afraid, fear means to be afraid of, of someone or 
or something as likely to be dangerous, painful, or threatening. The, the worry and fear, they, they kind of can go hand in hand because usually what you're afraid of, you also may be worried about. The, the world has all kinds of phobias. Anybody ever taken the time to read some phobias? Uh, the fear of animals, I didn't get into their scientific, but snakes, anybody afraid of snakes? I am afraid every snake is a poisonous snake to me. Every snake is also a seven-foot-long poisonous snake to me, regardless. I am afraid of spiders. There's a fear of storms. There's a fear of heights. There's a fear of flying. There's a fear of sickness. There's a fear of public speaking. All of these are fears that are in the world, phobias that are in the world. People live in a state of fear. They make up fear, fear of the ocean, fear of sharks. I, I typically about knee-deep my odds of getting attacked by a shark at knee deep is probably a little less likely. The best place to be is probably still the sand. That's, that's in my head. The ocean, when Harper says how many sharks are out there, and I Googled it, and there's a lot of sharks, that's enough for me to stay where I'm at, under an umbrella in the shade. But the disciples here have the master on board. Jesus is in a peaceful sleep in the middle of the storm. Let me say that Jesus is, is never phased by what's going on. There's no storm that's going to rock him. There's no storm that's going to disturb him. There's nothing that's going to uh, catch him by surprise. Jesus is as calm as he ever will be. And they awake him and they say, Master, do you not care that we perish? Our boat is fixing to sink right here in this sea and we're all going to die. And Jesus rebuked the wind and the sea and he says, Peace be still. Can you imagine for just a moment, you're the disciple that just questioned, do you not care that we perish? He speaks peace and everything's still and you're just thinking, man, I should have just believed should have just had faith that God could do something with this situation. And Jesus says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How long have you been with me? You've seen the things that I can do, and yet you are showing that you have no faith. So why are you fearful? Let, let me just read a couple things that Jesus said about fear. Matthew 10 and verse 28 Jesus says, and fear not them which kill the body. Don't fear the snakes. Don't fear the sharks. Don't fear other people. Don't fear them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. If you're going to have a fear of something, if you're going to have a reverence for something, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. If you believe what I believe about Jesus, there is nothing that our God cannot do. There's nothing that our God cannot do. And we put ourselves in a state of fear, and we basically tell God that we have an absence of faith in our life. So whatever fear that you have going on tonight, God is bigger than anything that you can be afraid of. Anything that you can be afraid of. I love reading King David, Psalm 27 and 1. David was a man that was on the run from Saul. He was on the run from his, uh, his son Absalom. He, it just seemed like the man was always hiding in caves, running from people that wanted to kill him. And here's what he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He has people chasing him to kill him. And he says, whom shall I fear when God is the light of my life and he's my salvation? Who can I fear? Because the last time that I checked, God is more powerful than anything. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So let me just put it in, in just simple terms. When you and I are fearful, we show that God is not the strength of our life. In Psalms 23, 4, David says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? There's a next little phrase right there. What's the next phrase? For thou art with me. 
There's a song that's called, Why Should I Worry? Here's just a little bit. Why should I worry and why should I fear? When the very same Jesus, he stays always near. He lives in my heart and he hears when I cry. I'll call on his name till the storm passes by. Isaiah 41.10, here's what the Lord says. Fear thou not. Maybe you're here tonight and Jesus is saying that to you. He's pulled up his chair. He's sitting right in front of you. He's asked you, why are you so fearful? And here's what he's saying, fear not. Fear not. Here's the reason why. In Isaiah 41, in verse 10, he says, for I'm with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. You see, when we worry, run to Jesus. When you have that moment of fear, run to Jesus because he is right there with us. He has promised that he is right there with us. Go to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, we're going to look at verse 34. Why are you anxious? Why are you fearful? And in verse number 34, it says, But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed. I'm in Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 8. I'm telling you, if you've never preached two messages on the same day, your brain does not fully function all the way. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. All right, here we go. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He's talking about the cost of true discipleship. If you're going to come after me, you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to realize it's all about Jesus. When he, the moment he saved you, it became all about Jesus, 100% about Jesus, no percent about you. Deny yourself and take up his cross and follow me. Verse 35, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Look at verse 36. Here's the question for you. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So he was just talking about true discipleship, what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. And now we have the contrast. We have the difference. He says there are men that instead of living a life for me and truly surrendered for me, they are living a life for themselves. So I want to ask you this question, what are you living for tonight? What are you living for? Paul said in Philippians 1 and 21, he says, For me to live is Christ. He says that I want to magnify Jesus in my body, whether by life or or whether by death. His entire purpose of life was to magnify the name of Jesus Christ. He wasn't worried about riches. He wasn't worried about fame. He wanted to live a life that was pleasing for Jesus. And you could put Paul right here in verse number 34. He was a perfect example of a true follower of Jesus Christ. True follower. But on the flip side, what are you living for? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? We have looked in youth and we've talked in here several times. If you look at the amount of money that's in Hollywood, and then you also look at the suicide rate that's in Hollywood, it it should blow your mind. You have $50 million and, and yet they're unhappy $300 $300 million, and yet they're unhappy. Why? Because money will never fill you. Money will never satisfy you. I'm going to take a moment. I'm not preaching against having things, but I am going to go ahead and be honest. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 7, I have this underline in my, in my Bible, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. You and I need to be reminded of that every single day that we wake up. 
We have to have a job to pay for stuff. We have to have a job to do some of the things that we just have to do, the bare necessities. But Paul goes on. He says, And having food and raiment, food and clothing, let us be therewith content. Think about that. Food and clothing, Paul says, be content. You know, I've heard people talk about this verse and like, you know, that's just an old-timey verse. They, didn't, they weren't living in America. Paul says, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And here's why. Here's what happens when you chase the riches of this world. Here's what happens when you begin to live for you and not for Jesus. He says, but they that will be rich, those that are chasing after riches, they fall into temptation and a snare. They fall into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Those are some pretty strong words right there. A temptation and a snare, foolish and hurtful lust, drown men in destruction and perdition. He says, for the love of money, key word right there, the love of money, people that chase after money, people that love money, and they are consumed with money. They will work every overtime they possibly can make so that they can make more money. He says, is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have what? They have eared from the faith. And they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And here's what Timothy says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. What are you living for? You say, I can't believe that you're preaching on things. I'm not preaching on things, but I'll tell you this. If you love things more than you love God, there's a spiritual problem. Do you work and you have to have money? Absolutely. But when you love things more than you love God, there is a spiritual problem. Matthew chapter 4, in verse number 8, Jesus is in his temptations. It says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and he showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. He showed everything that there was. All the glory, all the fame, all the riches, everything. And he saith unto him, the devil said unto Jesus, All these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. In him only shalt thou serve. So let me ask you again, what? are you living for what are you living for we read we started off in matthew in chapter 6 where he says for where your treasure is there will your heart be also you cannot serve god and mammon what are you living for when you wake up in the morning what's the purpose of your day is your purpose like paul to magnify jesus Paul says, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to share Jesus. I'm going to walk like Jesus. I'm going to talk like Jesus. I'm going to magnify Jesus. Is that your purpose? What are you living for tonight? And then lastly, go to John chapter 21. If you're with me, still say amen. I'm telling you, it would be a whole lot easier for us to ask Jesus the questions. But when Jesus begins to search our heart, when Jesus begins to confront our heart on anxiety, on fear, on what we truly are living for, and we close with this, again, there are over 300. We'd spend a whole year on these questions. John 21, beginning in verse number 12. This is after the resurrection. The boys went out fishing. Verse number 12, Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? And Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Verse 15, we encounter three questions. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? 
He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verse 17, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. The question for you is simply this. Do you love me? Not from Nick Payne to you. From Jesus to you. Do you love me? He asked Peter three times. What did Peter say? He says, you know that I love you. And three times, Jesus gives him a command, feed my lambs. You know that I love you, feed my sheep. You know that I love you, feed my sheep. Let me go ahead and tell you that the Lord knows your heart. There is without a doubt, we know that Jesus loves us. Romans 5, 8, but God commandeth his love towards us and that while you and I were sinners, Christ Jesus died for us for God so loved the world that he gave his only baby. There's no doubt that we know that Jesus loves us, that God in heaven sends his perfect son to die for our sins. We know that he loves us, but do you love him? You say, oh, well, yeah, I'm at church. What did he say? In John 14 and 15, Jesus says, if you love me, come to church. If you love me, give offering. If you love me, come to Sunday school. If you love me, do this. If you love me, keep my commandments. But I'll tell you what will happen when you, when you love him and you keep his commandments. You'll want to be at church. You'll want to be in Sunday school. You'll want to give in the offering. You'll want to be doing the things of God. If you love me, keep my commandment. The greatest act of love is that verb, and that verb is an intense feeling of deep affection. If you've never shown love to your spouse, they know it. They know it. They know if they feel loved. And Jesus knows right now, do you love me? You can fool everybody. In John 14, 23, as they come to the music, Jesus answered and said unto him, If, if a man love me, he, he's giving you the definition. If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my words. But here's the people that don't, is the ones that don't keep my sayings. having a one-on-one -on -one with that Holy Spirit, if you were sincere in the beginning and you said, Lord, search me. He's spoken to the anxious hearts in here, wherever you're at, whatever you're dealing with. You may be here and you may have no anxiety in this moment, but someone in this room does. Someone in this room is having struggle with fear. If you watch the news long enough, you can get locked into that fear. But let me tell you, God is greater. He's greater than anything you and I will ever encounter. You say, but what if? You know what Paul says? For me to die is gain. You know, I, I, from a kid, I... It's like, Lord, let's let me live till I can drive. Let me live until I graduate college. Let me live till I get married. Let me live till I have some babies. 
and you could go on and on. Let me live till I'm a grandparent. Let me live till I'm 99, still preaching the gospel. But if he calls me home, death is better. Why? Because I'm in the presence of Jesus. So why should I worry and why should I fear when there's nothing in this life that can take that away from me? So if you're here tonight and you're struggling with fear, be encouraged. God is greater. If you're here tonight and you're struggling living a life for Jesus Christ, maybe you're, you're so invested in the things of the world. Check out Timothy and what Paul says. And be careful about the pursuit of things in this life. And then all of us have to answer this last question. Do you love Jesus? You can say you love Jesus, but Jesus says, show me. Peter, you, you love me. Do what I've asked you to do. Feed my lambs. Peter, you say that you love me. Go feed my sheep. And you know what happened? Peter did exactly that. You know, tradition says that Peter was martyred upside down on a cross. That he was too unworthy to die the same death. Why? He was preaching the Lord Jesus exactly like he commanded it. You know what? I believe as, as Jesus stood when Stephen was getting stoned and he welcomed Stephen into the presence, I believe that the same very thing happened when Peter is upside down and he's crying out to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus welcomes him home and says, My son, I'm pleased. You did everything that I've asked you. You've shown me that you love me. You just haven't told me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the Holy Spirit of God. Search me, oh God. Do a work in my heart, oh God. And I pray right now for whatever is going on, whether it's anxious or fear or whatever is happening in this place, in this moment, I pray that you would speak to hearts. You would draw their heart to you, oh Lord. May they leave here knowing that we can rest in your promises. We love you, Jesus. Once you stand to your feet and sing with Corky.
willing and able to join us tonight in our Sunday night prayer, you can come on down.